Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, and um, it's a great conference and something I'm really excited about and fascinated with, so I hope that um, this presentation continues the discussion. I've altered my title slightly to DSE and API consuming applications because, as we'll see, I'd like to suggest that it's important to make a clear conceptual distinction between uh, maybe what we want to call the DSC and the interface that displays this data, but that's in keeping with uh, some of the ways we've talked about things so far. I've tweeted out the slides, uh, uh, but you can access my slides here in the screenshots that I'll go through. In my proposal for this talk, I propose to address the following two questions. Um, how can we include program application programming interfaces in our discussion of DSEs? And the second, dealing with um, what's the role of plurality and reusability in our discussion of DSEs? And accordingly, I'd like to continue to address these questions with some reflections and, and time permitting some demonstrations. What strikes me as important and critical in the second question is how we can promote plurality without redundancy. From my perspective, working on the corpus of late medieval Latin philosophical and theological texts, redundancy is an acute problem. The corpus is, in question is so large and so understudied that every redundant act, to, every redundant act appears to me uh, as a kind of threat to the dream of one day being able to study this corpus as a whole and to explore the corpus through a plurality of illuminating interfaces. And yet, in my field, unaffordable and unsustainable redundancies abound in our current events to take advantage of the digital medium and web environments. And just very quickly, I just took some screenshots of some typical uh, attempts to display an edition of a commentary on the sentences. And each one you see, text, bibliography, biography, search box, text, bibliography, the patterns are re repeated again and again and again. So my question is, how can we uh, stop making redundant interfaces and instead promote the creation of interfaces that present a data set in unique and, really, and revealing ways? The problem, as I see it now, is that energy and resources are being poured into the creation of mediocre websites that basically do the same thing, rather than allowing that same energy to be poured into the construction of common libraries for common patterns, and then to allow those libraries to be used to construct a common interface for common presentations while allowing uh, innovative and new interfaces to uh, emerge. <coughs> and in my case, this has involved rethinking what the core of my scholarly edition or corpus is. Over time, I've understood my job as editor less and less as one of creating a page or text, digital or otherwise. Rather, I've increasingly seen my job as fundamentally a task of recognizing and identifying data types and subsequently identifying the relationships between these data types. <clears throat> As an aside, uh, I think yours might be here. Uh, yours recently called for a, a needed shift away from the text as document paradigm and toward the text as work paradigm, or what I, what I like to call the text as network paradigm. And on this view, the publication of a digital or scholarly edition is not best identified with the publication of a book or website or really anything that a reader will encounter directly. Rather, the publication of a digital scholar edition should coincide with the publication of a data set, structured and serialized and made accessible according to the best practices of the field and linked open data. And this, at least, is what we're trying to do with the Scholastics Commentary and Text Archive. And in the time that remains, I'd just like to give an overview of the kind of data we're working with and what that network would look like, and then how some clients can uh, interact with that network. <clears throat> so let's talk about our data for a moment. Um, the corpus, again, is vast and complex, and we face two major problems it, when trying to metal, uh, model it in a presentation agnostic way. The first, we face the problem common to almost any critical project, namely describing the generative history from inception to its modern reception. And this history abounds with distinct but highly related resources that an interface needs to be able to navigate. Second, we face a problem perhaps more unique to scholastic philosophy and theology. And this is the fact that scholastic texts constitute a highly intertextual corpus of nonlinear texts. As I say, every text is in some way making reference to discrete parts of our text, discrete arguments that do not always appear in linear order. As researchers, therefore, we need the ability to both display the traditional hierarchy and also the flexibility to dynamically construct new hierarchies based on unique citation patterns or investigative queries. 
So uh, just for example, I've illustrated just four in a corpus of over 1,000 texts, each ranging from 1,000 to 3,000 pages themselves. And I've illustrated in an abbreviated form the complicated hierarchy of each text broken into a commentary. Most commentaries constructed in four books, each four books taking something like 48 distinctions, each distinction being broken down into questions, each question broken down into articles. So we have this hierarchy, and yet each discrete part of these hierarchies is making a reference to somewhere else in another hierarchy in another corpus. How do we model that kind of interaction? Furthermore, we're talking about a commentary tradition. So we're interested not just in the hierarchy that exists in one text, but uh, a slice across five centuries of commentary tradition. Uh, for example, the prologue is a common discussion for questions of faith and reason. Uh, so I may not be interested in the entirety of the Lombard text, but in the commentary tradition of the prologue. How do we model that as a different kind of hierarchy? And further, we might want to follow common arguments that don't appear in the same place in a hierarchy structure over uh, the five centuries, a thousand long commentaries exist. So we might want to be able to trace an argument that occurs in book three that's then found in a prologue in another text and then back in book three and then maybe in, in a text that's distinction two and distinction three combined. <clears throat> so to solve these challenges in order to create a truly critical medieval scholastic corpus, we aim first and foremost to publish not a website but it'll publish a data set as RDF triples, such that every connected concept in the corpus has a dereferenceable ID through which it can be annotated with subsequent properties or annotations and linked to other resources. So imagine something like this in a very abbreviated form. To solve the challenge, we've designed a model based off of a customization of uh, the functional requirements for bibliographic reference, or FERBER. And I'll just I'll move through this too quickly, but we can come back to this in questions if there's interest. Very briefly, we have a concept of work groups, and work groups can contain other work groups, but they can also uh, contain what Ferber calls an expression, which gets us closest to the idea of the book or the text we're generally familiar with. And an expression of Moby Dick or uh, written by Melville or the expression of the commentary in the sentences written by Thomas Aquinas. And every expression can have multiple manifestations. For example, the, the Venice 1505 printing, the, uh, the Paris manuscript, or, or the 1959 version of Moby Dick. A manifestation, in turn, has instances called items. And these items are actually physical and live in the physical spaces like in the library. To the Ferber model, we've added the concept of a transcription. A transcription is the idea of a digital representation of a manifestation. It's not yet a file or a file format. But a transcription alone can take the properties like has XML or has plain text. And this property points to this serialization of this transcription that exists somewhere on the web and can be in a distributed fashion um, and is accessible via the HTTP protocol. Finally, um, while manifestations are not yet something we can take a picture of, it is the idea of something that is physical. And thus, we have the idea of a manifestation surface that is not folio one, but the idea of folio one, the idea of folio two verso. And these surfaces then can be constructed to item surfaces belonging to an actual particular codex of which one can take a picture. And it's from here that we can make a connection to the IIIF idea of a canvas and link out the existence of images on the web in distributed fashion and make use of them in our corpus and our clients. But this, however, only models the generative history of our text and not the interlinear, intertextual, nonlinear nature of our corpus. And for this, I know this is very small, but it's just the idea, um, <clears throat> is that we've modeled this not just horizontally, with Ferber going across, but also vertically. So that we break our corpus down into the di document hierarchy, where every, uh, every node in the document hierarchy down to the paragraph and quote level gets an ID, and then uh, gets further identified as an expression, as having manifestations, as having items, as having transcriptions, and belonging to surfaces. And each level of the hierarchy can be further annotated so that we can identify any point in the hierarchy, for example, as a prologue, and then query for any part of a text that falls underneath that designation. The result, as you can see, is a complicated matrix. And here's an example of how we model this at the surface level, connecting to IIIF canvases, and connecting to the manifestations to which they belong. 
<clears throat> Finally, we realized that uh, we're actually able to automatically construct this kind of complex data set from simply standardizing much of the work that critical editors are already doing when they prepare even just a book for printed publication. Namely, this is identifying text parts, for example, making a table of contents, identifying witnesses, for example, making a list of sigla and witnesses, and making transcriptions. From these basic pieces of raw data, encoded according to a common field standard, we can automatically construct the data set described above. <clears throat> you see in this top window, I'm running a build script at this moment. It's getting the table of contents of each of the texts within our corpus. From these table of contents, it's reaching out to the known TI transcriptions somewhere in a repository in the world that can be in different places. It's collecting metadata from each of those TI transcriptions and constructing the corpus that you'll see in a moment. The result of this script right here at present is uh, uh, approximately two million triples. Uh, and a corpus of five million Latin words, and that probably represents one to two percent of the scholastic corpus. So it could get very big. <clears throat> um, and because we are publishing this edition, first as data, rather than as a, tight, a text tightly bound to any presentational interface, this, the result of this extraction is a publicly accessible Sparkle endpoint that any client can use that understands the data model and the API. So here's a first example of a primitive interface. And this interface is, I would say, not the addition, but an attempt to visualize the data set that is a result. So you have a top level uh, work group here. And that work group contains other work groups and also contains expressions. <clears throat> and I can scroll down to look at a particular expression. And you'll see that expressions itself have parts, but they also have manifestations and uh, other various parts of the data model. Now, one, the first thing this allows us to do is to build a common library so we can save developers who want to construct clients. Uh, we can save them time by building a common library similar, if you're familiar with Active Record, to query this database quite quickly. So again, for example, <clears throat> you see that I um, am using this common library called the LBP gem, and I'm just going to enter in the URL, the RDF ID, for this resource and find it. <clears throat> And now I can ask stuff about this. What kind of thing is this? Oops, I broke it. Oh, thank you. Good, it's an expression. I can ask for what kind of manifestations does it have? Like that, um, and so on. So anything that's in the database becomes queryable. And now we can construct clients very quickly that, are able, that utilize this common library. So the GitHub for this client is here. And so I'd like to take a moment and just uh, show one of, these, uh, one of these clients at a little bit of depth and then very quickly a few other clients. But this is the client that I spend most of my time working on and I call it Lombard Press. Um, and you can see that this client, I call a dumb client because it's information agnostic. Nothing about this corpus is uh, embedded in this client. This client doesn't know anything about the text it doesn't have any text within it on its server. It doesn't have any images on its server. All that's been done is pointed to a public Sparkle endpoint. And from here, I can go and view the text. <clears throat> it gives me a list of the available work groups. I can view work groups, <clears throat> and I can see work groups like this. But for example, let's take the ID here <clears throat> and actually just paste it in to this dumb client, Oops. and you'll see that the, uh, the client responds accordingly, grabbing the different parts of the text, making them available. And we have a search service that's external to this text, and I can see the search, and I've just searched that text. <clears throat> but the client will respond to other things besides just uh, the, the text resource. For example, our prosopography. The client doesn't know ahead of time that this is a, a person, not a text, but it, it asks what type of thing is this, and now it's a person. Suddenly I get the works known by this person, uh, information, and even a live query to DBpedia to get abstract information. And again, I can run a similar search, but this time I'm slicing across the corpus in a different way. I'm only searching those things that are written by Thomas Aquinas. Finally, uh, and really exciting for me, is again the way I talked about 
Um, the ability to slice across the corpus 500 years, uh, only taking a cross section of a very, very, very large corpus. Here I put in, I just want to see prologues from book one of Sentences Commentary Tradition. And now I'm getting a list of all the possible Sentences Commentary texts. And again, I can search a very unique kind of search that allows me to search just one set of node across uh, potentially a thousand commentaries. Now what happens if I enter into view one of the texts itself? <clears throat> Again, this is a client that doesn't have any text on its server. So how did it know how to get the text? It queries, it queries the uh, database, and the database, through a series of properties, says, oh, there's an XML version on this GitHub repository. Next time one of our contributors submits a pull request, and that pull request is accepted, this client will update with the newest version of, <coughs> of the text. And it's important to see that the client only took here the expression ID. It used that expression ID to find what's designated as the canonical manifestation, and then look for the canonical transcription and uh, display that first. But other transcriptions might be known, might be aware, tra uh, translations. And if you wanted to look at a diplomatic transcription of any of these particular texts, you could see it that way as well. <clears throat> this is something that I would like to stress has been tremendously helpful because because we have an ID for everything, we can take contributions for anyone. While it may be extremely difficult for a novice or a student to construct a perfect critical text, uh, they may be able to produce a usable diplomatic transcription. And because we have a place for it, we can include it and make it available. For the time being, it will be used, it will become the canonical manifestation. It will be used for search results and discovery. And later, as interest grows in a kind of cycle, because it's available, interest can grow. Uh, someone can come along and help make it better, and that, that critical edition can then replace the diplomatic transcription. But the, the replace doesn't mean that it's gone away. Uh, it's also available. Um, because we also have IDs at a very granular level, we can have functionality at a very granular level. So I can have a menu for every paragraph. And uh, I can ask for variants this paragraph. I can ask for notes for this paragraph. <clears throat> I can annotate this paragraph. But importantly, I can uh, construct an on-demand collation at a paragraph level. These lists are populated dynamically by the available manifestations for this text, and you get something like this. And of course, we can do the same thing for images. So we can view uh, a cross-section of the manuscript that corresponds just to this paragraph. And these images come from distributed libraries all over the world simply by pointing to where they are. And we can query the image directly. And I can move from one manuscript to the other without uh, leave, leaving my place. Finally, I talked about the intertextual and nonlinear nature of this text. <clears throat> so let's look at this text by uh, William Rothwell. Here's a diplomatic transcription, because we don't yet have a critical transcription. If I'm studying this text, I can ask for paragraph info of what do I know about it. And one thing I know about it is that this paragraph is actually an abbreviation of this, this note here. And without leaving a text, I can view the uh, the text from a, a commentary written 40 years prior. It's as uh, um, um, humongous and hard to navigate. And here I can see the two texts uh, side by side. And I, of course, can jump ahead to just view this text directly and study it further. I might ask something about this paragraph and see that this paragraph itself is referencing uh, uh, a text of Peter Lombard. And I can move through here. And finally, one of the really amazing things to do, when I did that build script, we're, we're taking all the active references that editors are making, and we're inverting them to record all the passive references. What this means is that um, we can create sort of a joint structure where uh, when ed one editor says this references this paragraph, another editor says this, this paragraph references this paragraph. When we get to this node, we can actually see, uh, we can sort of discover collectively what no individual editor knew in isolation, which is that this paragraph was discussed by uh, two different uh, text. So for example, we got to this paragraph because it was referenced by this paragraph, but we didn't know it was also referenced by this paragraph. And now we can jump to see that connection as well and moving forward and go see it. So I, I know that's really fast, but try to appreciate what just happened. We just moved through four different texts over three different centuries. I would have had to wait months for ILL to bring me, interlibrary loan to bring me all these books, and I would have forgotten why I made the request in the first place. <clears throat> Can I take one minute? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I just and then I'll I'll just do some uh, 
uh, displays while we take questions, but the, uh, <clears throat> the point is that all of this becomes reusable in a completely separate interface that has a, a different kind of purpose. The text I showed you was tech, the client I showed you was text focused. It's not images and annotation. Here's a completely different, uh, here's a completely different client that uses the exact same data. No new, no, uh, there's no new database, there's no moving text around, but has a different point of view in which text is central. I can go into any of these texts and the same table of contents information becomes a navigable guide for uh, viewing the manuscripts. I can search the manuscript with the same, very same text that I was using for the critical text, navigate to those search results, and compare these texts uh, side by side to other witnesses that are available. <clears throat> the last thing I'll say is that I, I want to, I'll finally explode the binary uh, that you're either making a choice between a web edition or a print edition. The print edition is just another interface, and we can use the same information to make great books. So the last command line right here is the command line tool that uh, uses that same uh, Ruby library to query where these texts are available. And without having to download anything, without having to know where any texts are, you can make a beautiful book. And, uh, and the result being here. So the way I imagine this to be particularly useful is that um, at the beginning of a semester, you're constructing a course and you want to give your students a course reader. You can query the database for the sections of text that you want, arrange them however you want. Uh, send that query to a command line tool like this and you'll have a printed reader for your course of exactly the text you wanted. Your students can have it for free and pass it around as a PDF or print it. Thank you. Great, thank you very much.